Welcome to the Seriously Podcast. I'm your host, Annalise Gann. Now let's get into it. Welcome to the Seriously Podcast, where we make light of serious conversations with really interesting people. Alicia Aitken Radburn is an author and reality TV star. After appearing on the Honey Badgers season of The Bachelor Australia and then Bachelor in Paradise, where she met her husband, Glenn, Alicia is no stranger to the spotlight, but admits sometimes that white hot spotlight that makes you famous can be the same thing that burns you. Her book, The Villain Edit, dives into what it was like for her to be framed as a villain on the series and the impact it had on her life. I wanted to catch up with Alicia to discuss all of this and more. So here she is, Alicia. Alicia, welcome to Seriously. I am so excited to be here. Thanks so much for coming in. I don't know you too well. So I yeah, want to start. I know. I feel like this is going to be a bonding session. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm so excited. <laughs> but I want to start the interview with some rapid fire questions. Perfect. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Cocktails or wine? Cocktails. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Oh, Perth. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's so boring, but I love, I'm, I've lived over east and Perth is Stella. I love that. Are you an early bird or a night owl? An early bird. Really? Yeah, particularly for work. I'll get up at four o'clock and crank out two or three hours and I'm way more productive than any time of the day. Wow. Okay. And are you a planner or do you prefer spontaneity? planner really yeah yeah that's interesting (laughs) because I want to lead in with saying your journey starts quite spontaneously correct (laughs) I mean that's how we all know you the Australian public came to know you and love you on the bachelor Australia oh I maybe not maybe not that first series (laughs) no but but bachelor in paradise we did yeah 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 but the later ones they started to like me the first one was a little bit rocky and we're gonna we're gonna get into that and um talk about that but take me back can you remember applying for the show and what was that like I do I was actually in Paris when I applied I had just gone through a really really bad breakup um with you know I think everyone has that past relationship where they felt like oh this would be this could be the one it was probably a little bit of youth and naivety I was sort of still in I was in uni when we were dating um, and I really wanted him to be the one but it wasn't a very healthy relationship and I finally kind of mustered up the courage to get myself out of the relationship and I did this kind of like girl power trip to Europe we were actually meant to go on the Euro trip together and as a part of the sort of like realization that I needed to leave him I went to him and I was like um I'm I'm leaving the relationship I'll pay you out your half of the Europe trip uh or you can fly over with me and then I'll just start like a different itinerary of host- I'll, I'll go to hostels instead of hotels. And but I went so he let me pay me pay him out. I was in Paris. I was really lonely. I underestimated. I thought it was going to be girl power. I underestimated how hurt and alone and how much I missed him. And it was around Christmas time, so it was particularly exacerbated going on, like, Snapchat and seeing everyone's, like, fun family Christmases. And I remember I went down to this, like, French 7-Eleven equivalent, bought a whole bunch of, like, prosciutto and cheese and a couple of bottles of red wine. And it was after one full bottle of red wine that I saw the ad for Bachelor Applications. And the Bachelor application actually takes, like, three hours to fill out. (laughs) Oh, wow. And so I sat and I took my time. I figured I've got nothing else to do. And then, yeah, the snowball just kept rolling from there. Wow. Then it all happened for you. I love that story, though, like cheese, red wine. Exactly. All the good good things. Maybe I am a wine person. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, That's amazing. But you get to the filming stage, you're chosen. You walk down the aisle 
And you see the Honey Badger, or Nick Cummins, as yeah. you know. He's a massive rugby player, or he was in Australia, for those who don't know. Did you know who he was when you were walking down the aisle? I knew who The Bachelor... So, basically, um, the producers kind of made a mistake and on the same day as all of the contestants from across Australia were meant to fly to Sydney and I was living in Canberra at the time, so I was being flown from Canberra to Sydney on that same day. And I don't know if it was a mistake or intended, but there was an article in the newspaper that wasn't just like... There was speculation all the time about who The Bachelor would be. Like, I remember... I actually remember before I knew him, now he's just like a Perth regular, but there was always speculation Cam Cranley was going to be The Bachelor. (laughs) I love Cam. And I remember, I actually don't think I've ever spoken about this, but I have a chat history somewhere with one of my girlfriends where she's linked me like a pedestrian TV article and it was all about Cam and it was like hot Perth firefighter going to be The Bachelor and I was like, oh, my God, that's my husband. <laughs> Cringe. <laughs> now I'm like, now we're like mates with Cam Cradley. Yeah, so, I know. <laughs> so good. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, Cam. Um, but there was, there was like a proper photo shoot with the Honey Badger. I wasn't a rugby union fan, so I didn't know of him, but I Googled him immediately and... To me, he seemed like like I was quite excited that he was The Bachelor um, because he seemed different. He seemed like a little bit more interesting. That sounds terrible to other Bachelors, but, like, all the other Bachelors were, like, quite clean cut, Mm -hmm. quite proper. He's a bit more rugged. He was rugged. He's a larrikin. Athletic. Yeah, and I kind of thought... Maybe I thought maybe I would fare better with a sort of like rugged larrikin than mm. the kind of golden boy. Mm-hmm. And how long into the season or the series did you realize they're pitching me as the villain? Like yeah. I'm I'm being presented as the villain because that's we'll get into it later. That's what your book is about. Um, how did that feel? And when did you know? So I think it was a sort of gradual process. I think pretty much immediately I had an inkling that I wasn't what I would call a wifey. Mm -hmm. Like I kind of, I could tell that we, that me and Honey Badger didn't particularly connect. Yep, from both ends. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, but I was sort of like... My whole experience on The Bachelor was, like, I think the, like, the kids would call it Delulu these days, but it was probably more like I was young and young and hopeful and and so when I met Nick, I, I didn't have that kind of assertiveness that I think that you develop as you grow older where I was able to kind of... Um, I was approaching men thinking, like, assessing whether I was interested in them. Yeah. It was all, like, whether they liked me or not. And, and then I you think, just take it. Yeah, I yeah. was just, like... I used to be like that too. They, yeah, that's all that's important to me in this interaction, that mm. this guy likes me. I would never, ever interrogate whether, like, I thought they were interesting or funny or what they brought to the table, which I think, like, I wish... I I think it comes with age, but it took me a while. And so... But but I think I kind of did have an understanding past all the Delulu that we were not... Like, I'd been in serious relationships. I'd had sparks before and I knew, knew we didn't have a spark. And so then, like, I kind of knew that I wasn't that sort of, like, top five contender. And then in terms of being positioned as the villain um, and, you know, in in my book, which we'll get to, I sort of interrogate what my contribution was to making me a villain. And I think once I knew I wasn't a front runner, I, I got really insecure about my place on the show and I think I actually lent into bitchiness and... Um, because I wanted to be relevant. Yeah, and it happens. Like when you're in that position, you've got producers 
looking at you, you've got cameras on you. I've been on two TV yeah. shows, not on that level, but, like, similar. You kind of want to say what they want to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, when you're sitting with the producer, like with – I mean, you're definitely a particular sort of person. Like, I think mm. it definitely um, – I would say that people who are people pleasers are more um, – predisposed to being able to be manipulated by producers in this way because a people pleaser just wants to do a good job and wants to please the person that they're sitting with. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you know, uh, the way that I describe in the book is when you're sitting in a booth with a producer and you you kind of push the bounds of starting to be a bit snarky and you get a laugh from them or maybe you get a comment that's like, um, oh, Australia is going to love that, then you, yeah. like, continue to push the boundaries. Or, and so, like, I think there's a play, playing with that, like, there's a very blurred line between a, a funny contestant on a reality TV show, like, fun, snarky, and being bitchy and villainous. Mm -hmm. And I think that producers kind of encourage you to push those boundaries. Um yeah, and so that's how I sort of found myself in that position. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, there was three villains, like, mm. in a group. Yourself, who else? Kat and Romy, yes. who I'm still very close to. Yeah, so you're still friends. Yeah. So what do they think of it? I think they had their own unique experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I talked about this a lot when, uh, when I was publicising my book and I went on a book tour, mm -hmm. um, that my book and my experience of my villain edit um, is just that. It's mine. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, you know, I've reflected on that period of my life and I've sort of found I, I feel that I contributed to my villain edit and mm -hmm. there are genuinely things that like that there were aspects of my portrayal that I felt were deserved yeah but I think that there will be other villains out there whether they're you know the villains that were with me on my season Kat and Romy or whether that's people from other franchises there will be people that reflect on their experiences and genuinely feel like they were really hard done by or they reflect on their own behaviour and they're like, I did nothing wrong. And that's their prerogative. Mm, okay. I've interviewed a lot of people on this show and, yeah, I've heard mixed reviews about it. So thanks for sharing. Yeah. Now talk me through. So you come off The Bachelor, you're watching the series, you're into it. How... Quick into the series, are you facing scrutiny from the public? And what made you want to do Bachelor in Paradise? Yeah. That's like, were you like worried Sucker to do that? for punishment. Or were you like, no, I want to find love. Like, fuck what everyone thinks. Sorry to oh, swear about it. It was really, it was never, I shouldn't say it was never about finding love. It was, I think it was first and foremost a TV experience. I think yeah. everybody... I think everybody that goes on one of those, that like the really heavy love focused shows, um, I think there's always like a glimmer of hope that you'll be the person that gets the love outcome because like everyone in like so many of us in this world are searching for love. Mm. And so, you know, how fabulous if you find it, wherever you find it. Mm -hmm. But it definitely wasn't. I was the under no illusions that going on a show competing with 28 other women was the best environment for me to mm -hmm. find a partner. Um, so in terms of scrutiny, it started pretty early. It was probably like episode two or three. Um, about the midpoint of the season was where our our characterization and sort of like we we started like people started making memes with our faces on um like Regina George and um Katie Heron and all of like the like the actual mean girls poster and stuff like that and um and then and, and yeah it was all obviously like very solidified towards the end um and in terms of going back for another round one 
the edit aside, I had really enjoyed the process of being on the TV show. Like, I really had connected with producers. I thought it was, like, I thought the whole TV production world was really fascinating. It was really fun. Like, I mean, you would know... Mm. It, it's a really it's a really good time. Yeah. I, I particularly, like, I really enjoyed it. I studied media and communications in university and it was kind of like it, it was just an insight into this whole world that I'd never discovered. And so I really wanted to go back for that reason. And, and from the sort of, like, I guess personal brand perspective, I thought, oh, it, like, it can't get much worse. Yeah. And I think I had faith that, particularly on Bachelor in Paradise, which was a different structure. And I I had faith that maybe with another chance to share my personality, maybe a more nuanced version of myself would be presented. And I think it was. Yeah. Like, it was very positive in Bachelor um, in Paradise. And that's where you met your now husband. Yes. Glenn Smith. Yes. Congrats, by the way. Thank you. got married you. last year. We, we did. Oh, my God. I had to think about that. We're coming up to our one-year anniversary, April 22nd. Congratulations. Yeah, it's crazy. We're going back down. So we got married in Denmark and we're going back down um, for, like, our one year. And that's just – it just feels crazy that it's – come around so soon so it was always meant to be you're always meant to find love on tv yeah and which is wild it's like so funny because I remember when I I I I remember when I first started the whole bachelor journey even though I thought like even though it was primarily driven by new experience I remember going on this walk one day when I was really in the sort of mode of deciding whether I would leave my job and whether I'd do The Bachelor. And I thought to myself, I just have this feeling that putting myself out there in this way is going to lead to love. Whether... And I think that, like, I think my thinking was it might not necessarily be with, like, a contestant. I thought it was going to be with, like, an audio guy or, like, the camera (laughs) dude. (laughs) <laughs> um, and I did flirt with one on Instagram DMs after the first show. Um, but, but, you know, like, the fact that it actually happened on the show was amazing. So you walk in. Yeah. And then you meet Glenn. Or he walks in. I walked in. You walked in. Yeah. What was your first impressions of him? Oh. I watched it. I I'm was pretty like, sure you were like, he's so hot. Yeah. Like, wasn't that the first I, thing that you said? Yeah. And he was just like, he he was not my usual type in the sense that, like, I've never been, I've never gone for, like, what I would describe as, like, the jock, like, the guy who's, like, sporty yeah. and, like, really conventionally attractive. Like, I'd always dated nerds and, like, and I think <laughs> almost that was, like, a bit self-protective of being, like... I don't know. I just thought, I thought, I thought if I dated like the hot popular jock, if you like think about American movie tropes, like I think of like John Tucker must die. Like if you date the John Tucker, it's like, you're going to get your heart broken. Yeah. You're, or or also like on top of getting your heart broken, I kind of just thought that like super handsome guys didn't have much to like offer intellectually yeah which is so rude (laughs) um because he like I fast figured out that he was like absolutely everything that I was looking for yeah yeah so exciting so you hit it off on the show yeah so when did you start dating Oh, well, like officially, we, yeah, wasn't we it straight off the show? Dated off the show. So, like, the last scene from the show is a commitment ceremony where you're sort of like, I've actually, my ma- my wedding band is, that's the, sh- the ring that he gave me on Bachelor in Paradise. And nice. we just repurposed it, cost of living crisis. No, I, love I just that. like, I was very sentimental. And, um, and so after we sort of like said, I love you on the show, they, like, film one last little scene with you where you're, like, in your pretty outfits and you're, like, holding a ring and you're, like, hugging each other. And I did, like, a confirmation. I was, like, 
are you like our wee boyfriend and girlfriend? And he was like, yes. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And so from that point forward, we were boyfriend and girlfriend and we were just like trying to make it work on the outside. Mm. And that's the hardest thing is making it work. Correct. Particularly when you're living on other sides of the country. <laughs> hey guys, if you've loved listening to the Seriously podcast, we'd really appreciate a five star review on Apple or Spotify podcast. It keeps us making incredible content for all of you to hear. Thanks so much. So you did long distance. Yeah. You had your ups and downs. Yes. That have been widely publicised. Yes. Are you open to talk about that? Yeah. Because yeah. that's very – people don't talk about it, but at the start of a new relationship, there are a lot of ups and downs. But yeah. people don't talk about it. And I wouldn't even describe it as, like, ups and downs. I'd describe it as we had a very significant down. You know, like, it was just down. It was. It was. It could. Because I feel like sometimes when I hear people being like, oh, my relationship have, has ups and downs, I'm like, oh, so you guys just, like, fucking hate each other and your, like, relationship must be really toxic. Yeah. If you're just constantly, like... You know, it's like I, I see, like, girls be like, oh, we fight all the time, but, like, we love each other. And I, I, I get it, but I think that, like, sometimes we need to analyse whether we're actually, like, in a healthy relationship. Mm. So, anyway, to speak about the down, and I go into it in much more salacious depth in the book, The Villain Edit, um, but when we first came off the show... Um, I flew, we had one weekend in Sydney together and then Glenn flew back to Perth and then on the second weekend that we were outside the show, so this would have been four weeks since we'd met, Mm. um, he was at a house party and he kissed a girl that we were on the show with. Yeah. And, and the girl that was... Like I'd say before, because I entered the show as as an intruder, and it was the girl that he had been sort of like seeing before I entered. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. And so, so they already had a um, you know, like friendship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, obviously, that was horrendous. <laughs> yeah. So he he rings me the next day, and he discloses what's happened. And then I was like, okay, well, I was I was devastated. Um, and I I was like, okay, well, we're done. Mm. And then across the across the next week, he kind of put a couple of things in motion where, you know, he he gave me a call and once the emotions had kind of it's not softened, but, you yeah. know, we were out of that, like, h- intensity of learning about what had happened. We had a little bit more of a chat about it and t- kind of tried to dive into why that had happened. Um, and then then a co- it's really hard because it's a very long time ago to remember <laughs> the cadence of, of course, events. Of yeah. But basically... Uh, we, we both, we shared a show psychologist. So there was like a psychologist on Bachelor in Paradise. We both worked with her as you, I guess you would kind of go to a couples therapist if you face this situation. Mm-hmm. And that was really helpful. Um, I, and then a few things. I told him that I was really particularly embarrassed to tell my mum, what had happened because my mum had flown to Fiji and she was featured on the show and she met him Mm. in Fiji and it felt really lovely. Mm. And I I said to him, you know, it would go... I I was still very much in the mindset that we weren't going to be taking the relationship forward. Oh, wow. Yeah, Mm. but I said, like, you know, if there was any hopes that we would give it, like, that I would give you another go... Um, it would go a long way if you rang my mum and told her what you did. It's always apologising <laughs> to the mum. <laughs> and he did. Been there. He did. That's good. And, like... Did she I've, forgive him? <laughs> she did. My mum's a very yeah. forgiving person and that kind of rattled me even more because, like, my mum rang me and was like, oh, I thought that was, like, quite brave. And, and, then, and then I sort of complicated things further and I 
was at a party with the whole cast and someone was congratulating me on, you know, the fact that we'd made it to the end and I had been drinking quite comprehensively by this point and I just told everyone at this party what had happened and I burst into tears Mm. and then I continued to drink and then later that night I slept with someone from the cast that Glenn also knew. Oh, really? Yeah. And then (laughs) you got to pick up the book because it's very... (laughs) Everyone gone by the book, the Millen edit. It's very well deconstructed in there. But Mm. basically in the process of me being at that party and sleeping with this person, Glenn was flying over to Sydney to have a face-to-face conversation with me. Was he on the plane? He was... (laughs) He's like mid-air. Literally (laughs) he... So I messaged him after I'd slept with this guy, literally... 20 minutes after I was in a Uber with the dude. Yeah. And I messaged him and I, I messaged Glenn and I said, when do you get to Sydney? And he said, oh, I'm just, like, checking in at my hotel. Mm. And I looked at the guy that I'd slept with and who knew Glenn, was quite good friends with Glenn, mm-hmm. and I said, oh, look, I think I'm going to go and see Glenn. And he was like, yeah, live your life. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, thank you. And I added a stop to the Uber, got out and let, let him go on his merry way. And I went and I, um, yeah, I went and saw Glenn and we had a very, very difficult, mm. intensely emotional night. Yeah. And then the next day we sat in a park and we just deconstructed the whole relationship, our actions, what we thought about love, what we thought about monogamy and and from that conversation we decided that we would continue the relationship. And Congrats. That's really yeah. mature. Oh, it was massive and it wasn't mm. easy. And there's no. many times that I like really doubted my decision making because I think that I think we do live in this culture that is very much and I see it in and a lot of the time it's very warranted. A lot of the time women do need to dump the guy immediately. Mm-hmm. Like the 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 person is absolutely taking advantage of them and treating them poorly and so so much of the time dump him is completely the right mantra but I do think that there is complexity to that and so that's sort of what I've tried to interrogate in the book Mm. and and I've written a few pieces outside of the book particularly one for Mamma Mia um, that that kind of speaks to the fact that, like, our deepest crisis was also what I felt really showed each other who we really were at our core. Mm-hmm. And actually the way that he handled our deepest crisis was, like, ex- extremely green flaggy for me. <laughs> That's beautiful. Like, he stepped up, he took accountability, he wasn't doing this thing where, you know, he was, like, uh, you know, evading what he had done. Mm-hmm. He felt sincere remorse mm. and he was prepared to take the steps to repair the relationship. And I think so much women are looking for... Like something will go in wrong in a relationship and then particularly women have it like manipulated to be their fault yeah. and the man will kind of like excuse themselves of accountability and or, or just like don't want to deal with their own actions so they run. Mm. And so, yeah, I, I really appreciated his approach and it was not the best. It's like it was not what you would expect as the sort of like intro piece to a I think we're coming up to five year relationship and one year married but um, you know we're still here we're still going strong and very much in love yeah thank you for sharing no no worries and I think that's important for people to hear because no judgment from my end like I feel like all the relationships, all of my married friends, mm. like the start of their relationship, the first few months were rocky because yeah. you're getting to know each other and there's like, 
conflicts and like you're different like you're two different people trying to join lives and it's never gonna be easy I, at the yeah start. I also just think like on you know married life yeah like if you're going to be in a long-term relationship with another person and this is to take it like obviously our language has been very heteronormative mm. but if you're in a long-term relationship with anybody you are going to have moments in that relationship where you feel like the best example I re- to get us through that part of our relationship we both read a lot of a writer called Esther Perel who Love yeah her. she's <laughs> queen and so I call it a psychiatrist yeah she's yeah. like a psychotherapist yeah. and she writes about this like one of the defining moments from one of her book called the state of affairs for me was she was like we have this expectation that our partner will never enter a lift and someone looks at them and kind of checks them out and that doesn't give them like a fun feeling inside and I was like and I guess like key to it was interrogating myself and my own sexuality and the way that I move in the world. And I was like, well, I can't hold myself to that standard. Like I will, if I'm at an event or a party or whatever, feeling absolutely hot and a dude like looks you up and down, you feel good about yourself. Oh, yeah. That doesn't mean that you... Uh, going to be unfaithful to to your partner or, you know, monogamy is a choice and I think we need to, yeah, you're you're going to have challenges along the way and it's how you approach those challenges as a couple which means, which determines your success basically. Mm, Thank you for sharing that. No worries. Really appreciate it. (laughs) Can we talk about your wedding? Yes. It looked very fancy. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you said that. It was very fancy. I was like, damn, girl. Oh, I love that. That looks nice. All the Pinterest boards that I was looking at were like, modern and elegant it looks like a, a living pinterest board well it was none very of my well. own creativity it was all of the vendors slash it was showing people pinterest photos of much more aesthetic much more tasteful people and being like hey can we do this do this yeah <laughs> congrats that's Thank amazing you. how it was, was awesome. it you had oh. some like a list oh Ooh. celebs there as well yeah that yeah. was the intention <laughs> <laughs> I guess A list. Who who is A list? Australia, like Brooke Burton. Yes. Um, who else? Yeah, that's basically it. Okay. <laughs> is it <laughs> Lockie and Irina? Yeah, Lockie and Irina. Yeah. They were there. Yeah. I knew there was a few. I just couldn't remember. But Jared Sang, Survivor. He's amazing. Yeah. Photographer. Beautiful f- photographer. Incredible. So yeah, I guess. I, let's, Actually, call Jade, it, let's call it a star-studded wedding. It was. Yeah. It made headlines. <laughs> you did very well. Thank you. It was, um, it was, the, I, I would, I read all this stuff and I mean, you'll be coming into it now with your own wedding planning. Yes. But I, I read all these comments of like, I was in this, the big group, Australian group, Wed Shed, and all these girls being like, like, happy to report it was the best day of my life. And it really does ring true. Like, I had such an amazing day. And I think what that comes down to is I think the, the most special, the, what makes weddings so special is that it's just all, all of your people. Mm-hmm. It was all of my most favourite people. And, you know, we really took a punt having it down in Denmark five hours south of Perth and a, and basically all of my people were from over east and mm. I had I had people who like I was so grateful that they traveled but like I was almost surprised that they came who were traveling from like flying from Canberra to Perth and then renting a car and driving down to Denmark and it was just so special. Mm, the things people do for love. My, yeah. When I was living over east, my best friend had a wedding in Dunsborough. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not fucking missing that. So, like, yes. I did that thing. Yeah. I flew over oh, and Oh, you're so down. good. No, so I get it. Now, to wrap this interview, yes. your new book, The Villain Edits, yeah. it's out. It's very impressive. Congratulations. Did you ever think you'd be an author? Oh, did I ever think? Um... <laughs> I think I hoped, but I – 
if it wasn't for the bachelor experience, I don't think that I would have written a book off, I guess. Like I needed the experience to shape what I was going to write about. And it's funny because people have asked me now if I intend to write a second book and I am just most definitely not writing a second book unless I have like, unless I live more life and I have more to say because at the moment I just like to be honest. Because was your whole life in that book? It was. Like up until now? It was five, it was five years. So mm-hmm. it was like a five-year period from applying for The Bachelor to getting engaged. And so I'll either need to live more life or if I was like I've contemplated writing fiction Ooh. And if I was to write fiction, I would just need, like, I need such a strong idea that it's basically, like, writing itself. And you are you have a publisher. Yeah. Yeah, Alan and Unwin, who are f- absolutely fabulous. Massive. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. So good. Can I ask what's next for Alicia? Ooh. Um, it might sound a little bit boring after all the reality TV and you know, all the glitz and glam of wedding life and all of that. Mm. But um, I work, I now work for a not-for-profit in, in Perth called Uniting WA and we do services for people experiencing homelessness, wow. um, disability support, mental health support, um, FDV, and I'm the senior manager of advocacy there, which means I help with a lot of um, sort of basically promoting systemic change to government. So the people that we work with trying to actually address the drivers of vulnerability and I just, like, I've been waiting for a while in my professional life to feel like I found a place where I belong and that I feel really fulfilled and so I'm hoping, like, I just can't wait to continue my work there. Um, and I'm also looking for, I pro- think probably the next chapter for me is looking for ways that I can more strongly fuse my professional life and my profile and being able, like, I feel so gifted with this Instagram profile and all of these followers and I think I'm probably just figuring out the most appropriate way to kind of segue my followers who are like of who are there for my love story mm. and who, you know, started following me because of me and Glenn. But I'm trying to sort of figure out how I can pivot to um, showing people more of like my work and hopefully making a difference. So... I think you're doing an incredible job of that. You should be very proud. Thank you. Can I ask one last thing? Yes. Do you guys want kids? Yes, we do. We do. So you could have a baby soon. Maybe. Maybe I'm going to be that annoying traditional person. (laughs) Yes, it's in the works. But, you know, like I, um, I definitely... I underestimated how... I kind of thought that, like... You shake hands with a guy when you're off the pill and then you're pregnant and trying to conceive really doesn't work like that. It really doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know. We're so told that from a young age. Like, oh take God. the pill from when you're 13. I thought he would sneeze on me and I'd be like, twins. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't happen. So you are trying then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're Congratulations. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Have you announced that yet? <laughs> Oh, I'm probably, like, it's it's really difficult with work. Like, I think that there's a whole world of sensitivity. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm pretty open. I don't of think course. I don't think my bosses would be surprised to learn that, like, a woman in her early 30s <laughs> who just got married is hoping to have a baby one day and start a family. But I think probably the reason why I haven't sort of, like, broadcasted over my Instagram is just because I think that there is still this sensitivity around you know if we do want to start a family what does that look like for my professional life and it like, means we lose all our money yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm a corporate yeah, girl as well yeah yeah so our income just see it's, ya. yeah so <laughs> that's so that's it. really challenging and I think it's been like it's been and it's so good to be able to talk to your audience who I think like a lot of people would be able to sort of relate where you do sort of have this growing anxiety of like 
um, I think we always talk about, like, can we have it all? And particularly when I've found myself in such a filling place for my career but also, like, wanting to start a family, mm. it's it's hard. It's like I don't feel like I can have it all. Mm. I, <laughs> at some point, like... Hopefully we will get pregnant, but then that will mean other things for my working life. So, yeah, it's a hard balance. No, I totally get it. I'm (laughs) in the midst of deciding things too. Yes. So I so get it. And it's really hard as a woman. And then it's more pressure on the man because they just have to work all the time. Oh, good. Around the clock. <laughs> Alicia, you've been an amazing guest. Oh, my gosh. This is – it's you are such an amazing host. And oh, thank it's you. it's been such a pleasure being on Seriously. Thank you for coming on Seriously. Thanks, guys, for tuning in this week. And we'll catch you next week for another guest. Bye.